Liz. So at least kind of, uh, you know, uh, ask why not? So, so what, would it, what would it take for us to really think after this post-Kantian uh, critical model to, to go back to form? Uh, so uh, by form also means uh, structure, a model, and a thought that involves a mathematical and philosophical logos in the context of ratio or concretized reason in computational machines. So to address aesthetics, this for, for me is to unravel the question of sensibility. So the form I'm interested in is whether this, uh, um, there's uh, a, a, a kind of form of, of the sensible in the, in the digital. What would it mean? What does it mean to have a form of the sense? It seems like completely um, you know, uh, contradictory, but um, let's see. So in relation to how transcendental reason encounters and frames the limits of what can be known. So the question of the sensible is about asking the limits of what can be known, namely how it wants uh, it at once a transcendental reason at once negates and depends on the indeterminacy uh, of contingency. So uh, this tension between reason and the limits of reason and the point the point at which sensibility allows for reason to uh, give a meaning to sensibility and how sensibility is really the portal into contingency. That is an argument that exists. So we have seen uh, Ariel, some of, of, of those today. Um, uh, so we hear some of the central arguments about uh, digital aesthetic, uh, which appear to assume that the medium the medium itself in its metaphysical, cultural, technical, and artistic significance um, of, of computational systems such as AI, so um, may offer an encounter with the sublime. So this, the medium as a kind of portal for the sublime and, and opening up of the sensible towards indeterminacy. That's where the state of the debate is. That's what I'm engaging with. Um, and so the sublime is demarcating things like the edge of the unknown or the incomputable, as a work I've done myself, or the incalculable. Um, so uh, from this, I'm inclined to suggest that this argument may still risk to remain entrapped within the philosophical schema that they are trying to escape. So that's an argument I'm going to make. <laughs> Try. So why it may be possible to argue that uh, the view of recursive aesthetics, for instance, uh, exposes the centrality of contingency that will challenge the teleological the, the teleology of form. I want to move on to suggest that AI rather offers a feeling moment or the feeling to hold into the loop of recursivity. This is what I call negative aesthetics, uh, and I, um, I'm thinking about how you unpack or unravel this radical alienness of the medium that cannot be subsumed to actually this, this game of the limit of reason and how the sensible plays the portal to go, go, go beyond the limits of reason. I think that's the trap that I'm trying to escape, and that's a kind of uh, argument that has been done um, in this aesthetic as well. So, to start with, uh, I want to go to the next slide. So, oh, that's not next. This is the next slide. Can you see? Okay, so to start with, I would like to refer to two examples of digital aesthetics. One that can be named correlational form, for instance, where the correlational model of algorithmic learning is stable, you know, now centered, most recently, on stable model diffusion uh, of ge uh, generative, uh, generative artificial intelligence for image production, recognition, and classification, points to a sublime that relies on the surrogate, racialized, gender, sexualized macro workers. And I will give an example with, you know, this discussion that Hito Stylers have been having recently. On the other hand, something called clone aesthetics or clone form that takes generative AI as an instrumentality that co-generates the digital potential 
for the expansion and distribution of artwork and of the use value of the worker. And my example is Holly Herdon. I don't know if some of you have it, but we'll discuss it. I will briefly discuss these few theoretical models very quickly in terms of, you know, let's say popular reception of what we think digital aesthetics is at today. Um, and then I will discuss whether they respond to the limits. Um, uh, uh, I will look at some theoretical, um, you know, frameworks through which we can understand these uh, uh, digital uh, forms, like correlation forms and clone form. Um, and then move on to my uh, argument for negative aesthetics. So, but let's look at um, these two examples. So, recently in the New Left Review, the um, artist uh, Hito Styler comments on statistical rendering of machine learning called stable diffusion model. I guess more or less everyone is, is familiar with that. We can talk about it later if you want. A central to large, uh, uh, large computer models such as large language computer models such as ChatGPT, DALI E, and so on. Her argument is immediately aesthetic and political because she looks at how the statistical media, she argues that this is what we're dealing with is mainly a statistical medium that could produce what she calls mean images. It's interesting that she uses mean because the mean is also a mean. Uh, it's a mean in the sense that it's evil, but it's also mean as a, as a medium, right? That's an interesting thing. She, she uses this quite, very interesting. She states, commenting on the, her self-generating uh, stable diffusion model, that she puts herself into the, you know, diffusion model of generative AI, as she has these kind of results, right? This kind of, as she says, mini images are far from random hallucinations. They are predictable products of data populism. So how is it that she, her image becomes mean and evil? You know, the kind of racial gender bias work to produce this kind of render. It's like a rendering of an image into these mean images. She says even mean images are experiments for optimizing racial classification by developers of data sites called racial phases in the wild. So um, this is an experiment that she did with this data set that was set up to fix up the problem the facial recognition technology were said to unperform on non-white people. She tells that the data set produced ghost-like apparition of racialized phenotypes, performing, as she quotes, a quasi-platonic idea of discrimination as such, end quote. These ghostly rendered racial uh, blurs on the right, she says, um, can be called vertical uh, group photo because uh, people are not located side by side, but on top of each other. Um, Staller reconnects this kind of older style to the statistician and eugenic, eugenic models of Francis Galton, uh, who had developed a, a, a method of photographic superposition to create portraits of criminalized profiles of discriminated people. Uh, but, but she says that statistical rend rendering today rather employs uh, an inductive method um, of learning that is starts from uh, data to compute hypothesis. So it's, it's different from what Galton was saying. It's a different model of rendering uh, knowledge. Um, as such, this is not a symbolic taxonomy of norms, but rather points to correlational form whose mode of algorithm production um, relies on surrogate workers that filter data. So that's a point. She says, uh, processes of abstraction and alienation are replaced with confusing but propagation processes, or more simply, social filters. So this correlation of form, she argues, is training not only neural networks, but more importantly, is training us, general users, but also is training micro workers. Um, the, the kind of surrogacy that is behind these social systems that are based on inductive methods that create hypotheses or racial identification that are blurred are um, uh, uh, what she said. Um, she says that Stahl, uh, saying that uh, this seemingly ghostly emanation of faces in statistical rendering are portraits uh, as portrayed by the hidden macro lab laborers 
laborers or macro workers are what haunts and pervade mean images. So the meanness, the evilness of the images is also to do the, with the act of the spectrality of the labor force, so the macro labor force that has to apply social filters behind. So it's not something, it's, it's interesting because it's like kind of an optical unconscious, you could argue in the, you know, Benjamin sense of, you know, the, the kind of the unconscious of capital comes uh, through the image in this of, of in this obfuscated blurring uh, opacity of the of the racial identification and gender identification. Uh, what she uh, why she points to the disappearance of people over the medium, um, a sort of sublime that skips mediation altogether, uh, a gesture to which she says a fake immanence. She also seems to raise the possibility of a ghostly aesthetics. It's kind of a, cor a correlated sublime that suspends our everyday training of, uh, in this future dominated by this digital oligarchy. So she kind of gives us this kind of political gesture of unlearning or untraining. So untraining is a way to actually escape or uh, I'll argue for a critical uh, form of digital aesthetics. So that's one, one model. Uh, on the other hand, we have this, what I call the clone form. So if you are familiar with Holly Herdon, unfortunately I can't show all her stuff because they will take me too much time and I have more things to say, but we can go back to some of the stuff. I don't know if any of you know her work. Um, so in Holly, to the, uh, Holly Plus, uh, Holly Herdon, this, uh, an artist, a music, uh, mainly as well, but she developed this uh, uh, vocal deep fake of herself generated by extensively training a neural network of her voice, on her voice. Her view is that any amateur musician can use it only plus to transform their pedestrian voices into hers, perfectly tuned and ethereal. She takes the data set training of algorithm precisely as the medium that can unleash the aesthetic potential of cloning her voice while recreating it through some kind of collective generative AI and that's st stepping beyond the simply application of the use of the medium. She is obviously an artist that is developing, you know, the, the medium as a, an aesthetic. So it's not really an aesthetization, but it's an aesthetic, the medium becomes this aesthetic material for her to, um, you know, regenerate her, the artificiality of the voice. We can talk about how the voice, you know, loses its sore eyes. There's so many interesting things we can talk about in an experiment. Um, Herdon, however, uh, seems to be reversing the problem of just uh, kind of being afraid that artists are losing their authority on machines. So she's not talking about the disappearance of the artist in the machine, but actually uh, she is interested uh, of, uh, to artists to reclaim agency and autonomy. Um, um, and instead of celebrating infinite media where everyone can rap as Drake or paint as Van Gogh, she urges uh, uh, artists to actually look at what happens to their voice, what happens to their data. And she has developed this uh, Have I Been Treated uh, website, I don't know if it's a tool, uh, so that artists can see if their images have been included in training data set. Um, obviously, not everyone can say, I don't want my voice there, or I don't want my image there, or whatever. You need to agree with the company, so there's a lot of copyright, copyleft issue and law um, uh, law issue, uh, legal issue, but you know, it's a tool that people can use to actually replace, she says, the human in the loop. That's a, that's a thing that she's actually interested in, but instead of um, denouncing, like uh, Ito Staller would do, about the disappearance of the worker, she's actually bringing the worker back at center stage. Um, and also, she uses this uh, a model of distributed ownership. Of, of a digital likeness by using DAO. Now, the decentralized autonomous organization, we know that is so central to blockchain. We can talk about, you know, my suspicion would be why, why okay, distribute the ownership, somehow it's still ownership. The problem with ownership is, is a problem that is central to, you know, racial patriarchal, uh, you know, capital from the very beginning. So I'm always a little bit, it's, it's interesting 
very suspicious in terms of uh, what kind of form, whether this form can really undo uh, the problem uh, of uh, uh, digital aesthetics form. So um, what we have here is a question of aesthetic form related to the medium as such. And as much as AI is setting up uh, or is being set up as a creative, cultural, political articulation of digital aesthetics, that occurs at the age of reason, at the edge of knowledge, perception, experience, which is always, again, an edge demarcated by the encounter with sublime. Right? The medium, as I said before, trans is almost given the, the task of transducing the unknown or, or bringing it the contingent into an otherwise non-creative uh, medium. Um, so, uh, but in order to, for me, have a deeper grasp of what uh, an aesthetic form for AI uh, can be, we really need to go deeper and look at current debates of digital aesthetics uh, that account, um, that could help us to account for whether this form is derived from a Kantian model of aesthetic judgment, which is really my, the core, the target of my talk here, um, or, and, and why, you know, uh, the fact that if he still relies on this Kantian aesthetic judgment, why is there a problem for whom, right? So that's something I want to investigate with you. So deeply, uh, sorry, quickly, I have here a very rough summary, so bear with me, you know, there's so much more nuance in all these debates, but for me, I'm just trying to make some maps or where we are at with this kind of coming to grab, uh, to, to grapple the, the meaning of uh, uh, digital aesthetic form. So, and, um, Anna Muster's work on deep aesthetics, for instance, is, is one that takes experience, uh, experience or computational experience as an answer to aesthetic. Um, uh, she tells of a, of a machine learning in terms of adjustment. She uses this word from you know, the work of Deleuze and Gattari, which really means assemblages. Uh, and uh, um, the way that this adjustment uh, uh, creates relations that are experienced not only by humans, but also more than human registers. So that, um, that there is a more than human register that is part of the agency, uh, distributed agency uh, of aesthetics here. So the deep aesthetic of machine learning is a node of models and technique that she calls, interestingly, not autopoiesis, or poiesis, which is something that we are familiar with, but heteropoiesis, but which includes, she means she's including the medium capacity of production. Um, so here, aesthetic coincides with experience as a generative form of the temporal indeterminacy and the non-predictive control of machine learning. So again, the, 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 the way the machine brings forth temporality of another kind. You know? So we have your work, Shane, that I was thinking about uh, as well. We can talk about uh, later, too, in terms of how temporality is what brings this moment of the unknown within otherwise uh, already programmed set of uh, correlation algorithms. Um, uh, so, um, as much as um, uh, deep, uh, so here deep aesthetic machine creativity can refer to the work of Oli Herdon and also Stephanie Dinkins, for instance, to argue that machine learning brings this heteropoetic uh, sensibility. So the machine itself is delivered a level of a capacity task to bring the world of the sensible uh, to us, so to, to allow for the world of the sensible to, um, yeah, to actually even interrupt or break from you know the, the schema of reason or the concept. Um, so as much as sensibility leans to the articulation of the aesthetic form, it is also according to Yu Kui driven by intellectual intuition. This is a, um, a book that I'm referring to by uh, Kui, which is called Art. And uh, it's, a, it's a book that came out, it's a little book, the game book. Um, I can't remember the title right now, but it's something, a specific book where it discusses art and more techniques. Um, so he argues that uh, while it is necessary to engage with science, it is necessary to go beyond that. So for him, intellectual intuition is a way to bring back the question of, of the aesthetic, 
uh, even in relation to Simon Don argument, who you know, in some of you may know uh, our guesses work quite well. Um, uh, uh, his argument is actually to for, for Simon Don to actually the, the philosophical, you know, somehow um, as, as a capacity to move the aesthetic beyond its limits. But but Yukui wants to go back to the idea of. Uh, um, bringing in relation the aesthetic with the philosophical. So it's re 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 recuperating the aesthetic in, in relation to Simon Don's argument. You also explain that Kant's critique of judgment provided an organic way of thinking regarding the beautiful and the sublime, uh, which are in his work a form, or, or correspond to a form based on reflective judgment. Here, reflexivity is fundamental to aesthetic and teleological judgment, but also recurs, uh, this kind of reflexivity, which is, is what Yuk uses to come up with the idea of recursivity in cybernetics, is also what is interrupted by contingency. So for Yuki, for Yukui, the self-reflexivity of, of the medium is uh, um, it's just an organological extension of a model of thinking that is already in Kant, but what he allows is the, the opening up of um, contingency into recursivity, so that you know the new can be accounted for, right? Or the sensible can be accounted for. Um, so this uh, organological, cybernetic, and digital machine um, allows him to argue that intelligence does not just come out from a philosophical system, but also from an aesthetic thinking. So he wants to give this capacity of the aesthetic thinking to be autonomous from a philosophical thinking. Uh, an aesthetic form um, is uh, not correlational, importantly, uh, for Yukui, but it's recursive. We can discuss a bit more what it means, because correlational, of course, will mean associative, it's about parts coming together. It could also be, you know, a model that, you know, still stays in the human, human model of experience, whereas obviously the recursive has to do with the looping. And the looping, uh, every time uh, it occurs, encounters for you, Kui, the contingent, I, what has not been determined yet, or the outside, or, you know, the the energy that the system needs to feed on. We can talk about it, the work, we can talk about it in many ways, right? So, um, so what did you is really after, which is this thing of the, the incalculable, right? Yes, he has recently talked about how we need to move away from a model of contingency based on incomputability and, and rather rethink of the incalculable as something that, uh, um, uh, allows us to, uh, you know, to, to kind of not subsume aesthetic to, to philosophical, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a both a Kantian and Kantian move, but I will talk about it in a sec. So I just want to pause a second and ask another fundamental question. Can aesthetic thinking in its recursive relation to technological thinking and to philosophical thinking as we you uh, is, uh, is presenting us and do the authority of formal thinking as a whole. How can how that, to what extent that just to think about the aesthetic moment uh, separated from the philosophical or you know recursively related to it can actually really allow for us to suspend to break the, the authority of, of formal thinking. Um, does the, this recursivity challenge? the subordination of the medium to philosophy and aesthetics um, as setting up the metaphysical framework of, of reason, imagination, and judgment. So to ask whether intellectual intuition can pave the way to an aesthetic form as a form of sensibility that bypasses the authority of the concept of schema may not be enough. Um, uh, um, without uh, creating or allowing for the critical space where the unknown and the incalculable do not fall back into what one could call the transcendentality of recursivity. I, recursivity is always already the condition for thinking. Is it? That's my question. Um, it, obviously, in the Kantian schema, it is. 
<laughs> for sure. Uh, but is it the only one, right? Or is it the, the one that has always to return as the backbone or as the pillar of, of, critique, of critique and form uh, as a whole? So another um, model that we have here, I have, uh, the, just quickly I mentioned tech and aesthetic and district aesthetic, so just random words, but obviously for me, but obviously Wolfgang does talk about tech and aesthetics. Um, um, just to give you a little sense. Um, so, for instance, uh, uh, is, you know, the counter argument to recursivity will be this idea of uh, looking at the discrete, right? That there is no possibility of folding things back or relooping things back. Um, so, uh, he talks about the medium uh, as a time discrete machine logic. Uh, which is transforming life into time discrete ex aesthetics of existence. Here, humans are in the loop, but they are altered in their inner sense of time. So the discreteness is not just a tool, but it's actually the condition for thinking becomes discrete, right? That's what, uh, and for, for, for the aesthetic encounter with, with the sublime as well, I guess. So uh, this is what, uh, um, you know, Stalin laments, right, that capitalism is imposing this uh, training of correlation of time that would be a, a training of indiscreet time. Uh, on the other hand, um, Beatrice Fazzi offers us a reconceptualization of formal abstraction in computation and also a renewed engagement with the medium discreteness. That's what she's after, uh, similarly to um, differently from Wolf Ernst, because she reads uh, indeterminacy um, in this discreteness. So indeterminacy is not the contingent outside recursivity or as something that is co 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 with uh, with recursivity, but it's actual uh, within intrinsic to the, uh, the, the discrete, uh, discreteness itself. So, um, uh, for digital aesthetic to become generative, one has to turn to indeterminacy as, and in her work, she does by looking at Turin, uh, Alan Turing's notion of incomputability. Uh, Fazzi distance uh, her argument for a model of digital aesthetic qua experience, and rather pushes the possibility of formalism, of form, stemming, stemming from its own indeterminism. Uh, i.e. Um, what could be called a discrete abstraction without content. Uh, it is here that she recasts the relation between logic and aesthetic, abstraction and formalism, not in terms of virtual potentiality, uh, and I guess she's referring to Deleuze uh, and Gattari model of virtuality or Bergsonian model of potentiality in terms of uh, um, virtuality of, of a model of the continuum experience of time, uh, and actually she turns to what she calls the potentialities of the digital, um, which she refers to especially in relation to incomputability. And it's also this, this potentiality of, discrete, uh, of discreteness for us, for us, for her is also an indeterminacy of quantity. Quantity itself is not uh, a metric system, not a, a, a discreteness of parts, but in itself uh, there is uh, um, a, a, an indeterminacy of the number, an indeterminacy of the algorithm that has to do with this, you know, model of uh, uh, infinity within a set. Right? We could call it like this, right? That the relation between uh, the set and the, the way the, whether the set can contains larger numbers than itself could only be a, an empty set, how do you define it? That's a Cantorian question, right? That is very much uh, central to, you know, Alfred Northwest, that, that I guess uh, is also behind Fatsi's idea of how you define an infinity without locking the infinity within something that even if it's empty, is already set. That, that's a mathematical problem of infinity, and she's grappling with that to bring back science, mathematics, as, you know, open up this formalist to its um, limits, right? And that's, again, stands within the Kantian question, which is an important question. Uh, but nonetheless, um, 
you know, is within this kind of uh, effort for Fazi, and I might be wrong because I haven't discussed that with her con con uh, directly, that actually the potentiality of the digital allows for a generative capacity in the ontology of computing. That's what she says. And I'm also wondering whether, you know, a, la, a, a bit like Frederick Kittler, we do need a media ontology. And why? Why do we need an ontology after all this argument? What, what is this ontology, this being that we are actually after? And what will it give us in terms of critique of um, try to, you know, challenge the model of representation, the kind of pillars of epistemology? Why do we need ontology? Why do we need the media computation ontology? That's a, a, something that I am wondering question uh, in my own work. Um, so maybe, you know, this proposition uh, of Fazi might speak to Holly Herdon clone aesthetics uh, because it pushes the potentiality of discreteness to expose the kind of uh, the way co the computational processes of voice, tonality, frequency, you know, open all these discrete quantities actually open to this kind of almost choral aesthetic, um, which is called a collective aesthetic. And you imagine if you have Holly's voice, you can add your voice, you can speak to her voice, you know, the, the breakdown of that kind of, uh, you know, analog line becomes, uh, you know, pregnant with so many possibility of, of, of microforms as well. So that's um, probably interesting for that. Um, so uh, these are only some possibility of how we can read, uh, you know, this kind of um, stellar model of diff critical diffusion or the use of the diffusion model by Holly Herdon, uh, because uh, um, they uh, are not simply another aesthetization of the machine. I think that's important that all these work are not just uh, uh, conservatively, I think, aestheticizing the machine but they engage with the technical as a principle of organization of the sensible. That's what they're doing. That's interesting to me. Uh, so the technical as a principle of organization of the sensible, which is above all a critical disconnection from the metaphysical representation and from this kind of hybrid post-human model of the human and the machine. I think they are all trying to do that because they are all really interested in what can you take with the medium that um, is uh, uh, philosophically uh, relevant um, in, this, um, uh, yeah, in this account. So this theory offers as an articulation of the immediacy of the technical in its attachment to the spatial temporal condition of thinking, imagination, and judgment, by which I mean that the very principles of thinking, of imagination, of judgment, of, to, uh, of uh, uh, philosophical judgment or aesthetic judgment are here, you know, open to the technical. It's interesting. So the technical is revising those principles. And that, that's the potential of this critical work, I think. Um, but then I have uh, uh, um, my own kind of, um, yeah, my, I guess we do all do critical work. So what is the, I guess I, for me, there is a, some question that I want to ask here. Um, to what extent do these e efforts uh, to challenge the principles of thinking, of imagination and judgment, offer us a critique of the media, um, uh, they, they, they look at the, at the, at the medium itself, um, uh, and uh, a generative AI, to what extent do really they challenge the way aesthetics itself is set up to rescue philosophy from its over-determination. So to what extent this work challenge the way aesthetic itself uh, set, is set up, always already set up, to uh, rescue philosophy from its own over-determination. For me, aesthetics does the work for philosophy. Um, doesn't the sensible capacity of generative AI, whether it is cursive, whether it is discrete, still work to preserve thought against its, its, its indeterminacy and the limit of reason? After all, as much as we remain within the realm of aesthetics, we're always already bound to the realm of philosophy. 
So as much as we talk about aesthetic, we are always bound to the realm of philosophy. Here, aesthetics ought to be a creative or generative supplement. Aesthetic itself is a surrogate of philosophy in the same way as generative AI must have accomplished a servile function. Uh, I generative AI must, serve the, must accomplish the servo mechanic task of the medium. So the medium for me is always what uh, must carry out, bear, work for thought. So to, to think that aesthetic can save us from um, uh, the work the philosophy needs the medium to do for itself, is uh, you know it's a, it's some kind of a trap something that we need to question um so the medium and I, when i think about the medium of thought right you can think about uh models such as writing uh photography painting uh anything that goes through a medium like you know in the kind of even derrida question oh it's always betraying thought it's always putting thought into some kind of irritating, frustrating uh, position. Right? Because the, 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 the medium is doing thinking in a way, or you are into the thinking zone in the medium without, uh, you know, uh, without having to rely on what you already have thought, right? That's, there is something in that kind of procedural capacity of the medium that uh, this, you know, the car, the, it's not just carrying though, that's the idea that you just write what you already know, right? It's a platonic idea, but it's also you know, a Kantian idea. And so for me, this is uh, something that we need to still look at. We haven't really looked at that uh, so closely. What does it mean? If a digital aesthetic must concern an aesthetic of the medium and not its representation, what seems to be missing from these debates is a critical insight into the instrumental condition of the medium, the instrumental condition of the medium. This is not only an argument against the teleology of technology. I'm not just worried about the fact that the medium always, you know, is a teleological end for philosophy, uh, but instead I understand this condition as an operative thinking for which machine must coincide in the, in the philosophical schema with servo mechanic means without ends, body without souls, enfolding the abstracted rules of the slave, of the figure of the slave within themselves. Others have done this argument. This is not a new argument. I don't know if you know the work of uh, uh, Louis Chu de Soke, uh, the work uh, of, you know, cybernetic, uh, 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 other cybernetic theories. Um, where, um, you know, the work of uh, Fred Morton, where there is a, an instrumentalism uh, in, in this figure of, uh, uh, of the slave that returns um, as overlapped yet again within the media. So there is some kind of, it's not just an, an, an analogy, it's a, about thinking about the principle of instrumentality. Where do they come from? Right. Where does this idea of the servo mechanic model of cybernetics, which Wiener talks about, I don't know if you ever read the human use of human being, but he is grappling how we get out from this cybernetic model of the medium as a servo mechanic system. He, he asks that um, uh, very clearly. Um, and so, any account of digital aesthetic must be then an account for transcendentalist instrumentality the conditions of instrumentality, that's what I mean, concerning how AI entails the condition of, of a servo mechanic war machine, for which I mean a techno sociogenic enfleshing of the slave in the system. This idea of the techno sociogenic enfleshing of the slave in the system is an idea that I developed, or a, you know, an argument that I developed through the work of Sylvia Winter. Uh, uh, model of sociogeny that she developed from Franz Fanon to talk about what she calls recursive epistemology, another term that she borders from uh, uh, Bateson, Gregory Bateson, who was here, you know, in this idea of adapting recursivity to understand epistemology. And, and Winter asks why there is always an overdetermination 
uh, of certain ontoepistemological structure that she, you know, relates to, you know, the, the, the transformation of the Judeo-Christian model into the secular model uh, of uh, racialization of knowledge. And she's using cybernetics. She's using this recursive model to understand the overdetermination of, of um, uh, you know, what she calls men one and men two. We can talk about it later, but it's interesting how this this thing actually happened here. <laughs> Stop for them. It seems to have been forgotten somehow, left in the in Zangando's uh, archive. But then, I, so for me, it's super important to develop this actually how the sociogenic function is actually a techno sociogenic function. Uh, which refer to how uh, rules are not only enfleshed on the social stratum, but how these rules are also fractures within this recursive contingency of the system. So that, you know, in a way, the enfleshing of the sociogenic uh, knowledge of uh, racialization, of sex sexuated and gendered knowledge, returns in the system not only to be repeated, but also to be broken away. So that's, that's something in which uh, um, uh, the aesthetic question remains uh, a point of contention within the recursive epistemology. So, but what kind of aesthetic? So, as much as aesthetic is demarcated by the encounter with the sublime, and digital aesthetics because it's concerned with the contingent in the shape of the discrete infinity, the incalculable, incomputable noise, randomness. It is also demarcated by the enfleshed rules of the servomechanic condition of the medium. So it is also demarcated by the enfleshed rules of the servomechanic condition of the medium, which are held within the system. So they are held this as something that is like a, um, uh, what I call the radical alienness that is, must constantly be negated. It's a threat, it's an irritation, it's a frustration within the system that needs constantly be managed as contingent, managed as random. Uh, in short, the condition of instrumentality also need to be understood as a, what I call negative instrumentality. What is negated by the system, but what remains within the system as a negative thing that cannot be erased, that cannot be solved into a Kantian or a Ganyan model of recursivity. That's my uh, one, one of my insight to this. Or what uh, Fred Morton called anti-instrumentalist instrumentality of the slave. I something that uh, not only you know, breaks, but question the authority of aesthetic to court. It's not just a, a kind of little rapture, it's just a question of the pillar of aesthetics. Why do you need aesthetic if you're doing this kind of critique? And how, what kind of a critique of aesthetic one must do if we are doing this critique? Uh, so, from this standpoint, one can ask, how do, how do these, uh, um, version of aesthetic for maintaining AI generative capacity of capturing the sensible or this relation between the sublime and contingency, can they save us from the AI model of value extraction, of surrogacy, of control through variance, machinic enslavement? Is this question, this condition of instrumentality, is not question, it's not open, as a political problem uh, and not just as an aesthetic problem. Um, one problem that has been overlooked is what stands for the sublime in this system of representation and how the sublime stands from what must be fetishized and negated to ensure that the sensible leads us straight back to reflexivity, to recursive thought and to the matrix of sensibility. In this respect, um, uh, the work of Zakia Jackson importantly argues that, end quote, the black maternal marks the discursive material trees, effects and foreclosures that, um, that generate the fleshy material metaphors of the black feminine sublime. So she's making an argument that the place of the sublime is the place where, that is being held uh, the, by the black maternal. Uh, for Jackson, at the core of Western philosophy, there is a paradox. 
As much as it is claimed that blackness is deprived from the capacity of sublime judgment, this is something that you refer to in the, in the writing of Kant, so too, and quote, a sublime attribution has been imposed on blackness and a latent power or capacity to potentially activate a threat to visions of totality they might perceive, that we might perceive as generative, end quote. What Jackson is after is, end quote, the sublime anti-black and sexuating condition of discursivity itself, end quote. Since the sublime carries within itself the function of negation, right? That's, that's in the classic sublime model of Kant, and demarcates the limit of reason, it is the moment at which thought is exposed to a threat of contingency without recursivity. So, you know, the point is not that contingency is, uh, is problematic. What is problematic is contingency as, you know, what allows for recursivity to come back, right? What if we stay with contingency without recursivity? And that's, I think, that the work of Jackson allows us to talk about the sublime, uh, instead of the sublime, she calls it, she calls it the void. Um, uh, so, the, so, since the, uh, so that the sublime is intrinsic to serve for mechanic instrumentality is to account the, uh, for the negative condition of blackness a sexuality for thought, imagination, and aesthetic judgment. So, what the, what the, if the sublime carries this negativity, this negative condition of, uh, of racialized, uh, sexuated, gendered knowledge actually always maintains a moment of contingency that cannot be repaired. Yeah. And that's what I'm interested in, this irreparable threat or break or wound, as you want to call it. Rather than, I don't want to solve it, I want to expose it. So that's uh, uh, one way that I think form is interesting, could be interesting. Yeah. But anyway, so um, uh, the irritability and the intolerance of the alienness uh, of the instrumental condition um, in this social technogenic uh, stratum insurges each time, uh, one time and each time, everywhere, uh, and cannot be equated with the sublime. Indeed, indeed, here the contingent and the sublime can no longer be espoused and merged into the one of philosophy. Uh, the question, therefore, is if the sublime needs a subject, because that's what I think, the sublime is a subject and an object in its judgment, can AI remain fugitive from the organizing principle of the sensible? It can be a, a, a fugitive AI in the, in the Fred Morgan and, and Stefano Arnin sense. Can, can AI be an anti-instrumentalist instrumentality uh, that actually uh, exposes this constant social technogenic processing of indeterminacy because it's always there. I don't need the people to come. I don't need the AI to come. You just need to look at the medium and the condition of instrumentality to look for a possibility of indeterminacy without the authority of the sublime. At least this is a task. I don't know if it can be done. You can tell me actually this is impossible. Fine. But I have this question. Um, and one person that, oh, sorry, I had this. You can a little bit of time, so I forgot to turn the page. Mm -hmm. Because maybe my accent is so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the work of Encheri Muto. I don't know if you know this work. Um, and, and, and it's interesting because Zakia talks about it as the, you know, as a, as a kind of, uh, uh, you know, our absurd form of the sublime, you know, that actually doesn't really fit. Um, do you know her work, Mancheri um, mm. Mutu? Yeah, I think it's super interesting for, you know, digital aesthetic um, and cyber aesthetic. So, um, and now I can move to the next one. So, um, for, uh, Francois Latour, for, for, for Francois Laruel, for instance, it is not the sensible, but science in the model of quantum mechanics uh, to each time and gender what he calls a, con a conjugation of variables of philosophy and aesthetics without the sublime. 
Instead of a transcendental schema uh, where the limits of reason demarcate the encounter of the sublime, Laruel proposes the scientific no models such as quantum physics. And here this interesting because there's an interesting, I am referring to Francois Laruel as one way, okay? That's not the only way. Another way to think about this, uh, um, uh, this science model is Cara Karen Barat. Um, you know, and their work on quantum entanglements. That could be another way in which she talks about the quantum as nothingness. That's another way for me that speaks to the possibility of a negative form of aesthetics. Um, so uh, he calls, um, Laruel refers to the imaginary number as an algebraic coefficient in quantum physics that describes the mutual relation between art and philosophy, not through the authority of concepts or objects, but through dynamic of vectors or their vectorial, vectorial trends. Following what he calls an immanence without authority, so without the authority of aesthetics, without the authority of philosophy, in fact, all his work is called non-philosophy or non-standard non aesthetics, uh, Laruel re rejects any hybridization, any notion of hybridization, which he actually says is, you know, is a colonial concept. He rejects this and insists instead on a conjugation of non-colonial variables. He observes that while philosophy lacks a concern for know-hows, for techno-oriented processes of the real, art lacks a concern for causal conditions. But the conjugation of variables allows him for this rivalry of philosophy and art that cannot be solved and is not to be solved in a dialectical synthesis. Um, for him, superposition, where imaginary numbers stand for you know, in, indeterminacy, incomputable condition, and so on, are actually what can open up a fracture within computational programming. So one can follow Laruel's insistence on this kind of um, imaginary number to suggest that, for instance, the incomputable carries an anti-instrumentalist instrumentality because it turns contingency into fictions. Uh, Laruel talks about fictions as photo fiction, music fiction, dance fiction, where it's not just a, a narrative, right? it's not just an opposition to philosophy, is the materiality of philosophy, that's how he could say. Uh, so something that uh, doesn't uh, uh, carry a performativity, it doesn't have a model of, uh, um, you know, re repeating the question of the universality of the one, uh, like, for instance, in the work of Badier, of Alain Badier, but it remains this kind of, um, it calls, uh, 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 as it were, um, algorithmic fatality. It's something that happens, what he says, in the last instance, cannot be programmed, happens one time each time, and it could be the last instance. That's what he means by immanence without authority. It's much more complicated than that. I'm just being very rough uh, with this. But it's because, you know, I'm just, I'm not repeating what other, you know, I'm just doing my work, so people have to forgive me that I'm not canonical or, um, no, I don't follow things a la lettre at all. Uh, so, um, Laruel talks about this form fiction as a quantic identity, a structure of the two and the one, a superposition of vectors, an underdetermined identity, which is not complete and actually brings aesthetics to this quantum indeterminacy. Uh, um, so, Perhaps what is missing from philofiction, and I'm, I'm drawing you to a conclusion here, uh, uh, or, from, uh, or this uh, immanent superposition, is yet again an alienation. The alienation and the alienness of what is negated. And I think that I want to add, add it's important for me to hold on this uh, idea that negative aesthetics does hold the vacuum. But it's not a virtual vacuum of potentiality, rather a digital vacuum of, pot of, dig yeah, of potentiality. But as a, as a vacuum of the of the negated, um, of the negated, of, of what even Laruel calls the stranger in flesh and blood. Um, and that this this work here by Sade English, the Red Series, it's, it's 
pretty amazing. She's a British artist. Um, and um, which uh, demarcate the condition of thinking as cross out. So the condition of thinking is crossed out, is the crossing out by the colonial, sexuality, and racial, racial principle of thought and the sensible. So whatever is being crossed out, negated, it's what for me all the, this kind of vacuum space for, the, for a negative form. Yeah, which is not just the obliteration of form, right? It's not just the impossibility of form. It's an alienated form. So um, I don't know if this is possible, but that's what I'm after. Uh, similarly, what is missing perhaps in the critique of digital aesthetics um, is this uh, irreparable fracture that exposes the instrumental condition of AI, which is at the core of philosophy of the sensible and of the recursive ontology to core. Uh, philosophy uses aesthetics to withdraw from itself, so the, in the Kantian model, right? To revise its premises through the encounter of this with the sublime, which has this fetishization of contingency, um, resolved by aesthetic judgment, which is now delivered to automated decision of Dali. That's what Dali is doing, is doing that work, right? Of is deliver the function of the sublime. Uh, to actually re reset up philosophy, the authority of philosophy, the authority of critique. <clears throat> we need philosophy, we need moral judgment, we need ethical judgment to actually discriminate from uh, what the, the, the limit of the machine, right? Yeah, what is doing. How do we recuperate uh, the machine, the servo mechanic instrumentality of the machine? That's always, for me, the question that uh, has come out from this uh, impossibility of this generative AI to run with uh, noise, for instance. Um, so uh, here, the aesthetic form of AI is set to purge philosophy from its ontological indeterminacy and give philosophy a concept, a sensible, a subject, and a law. So just redoing the same work. But one could take GI, uh, sorry, generative AI, stable dif a function of stable diffusion, which, uh, you know, as I, I didn't talk at the beginning, but at the beginning, you know, there's this thing of what it does uh, in terms of, um, of incomprehensible. This kind of, you know, function, this is a function of, uh, a kind of increment, incrementation and compression of noise. It's always working on noise. It's a very important, it's called, you know, the, uh, the, the noise function, the kind of compression function, but the compression of noise by noise, as it were. So noise is used twice as a weapon to decompress itself. Um, um, but maybe this is the place where, for instance, one can find the irreversible openness to a vacuum from reason, imagination, and judgment. So the argument for a negative aesthetics is also an invite to work through a critical field of non-instrumentalist instrumentality, namely not for generating purposeless art. You know, there's been an argument by people like Pagland that you know maybe we can just work on uselessness of technology or of art, right? That we, that's maybe the way to get out of this constant re-instrumentalization of, uh, of, of, of art by capital. But for manifesting alienness in contingency, noise, uh, and in computable quantities each and any time in the last instance of computation. So the fusion models from this standpoint cannot avoid for machine thinking to interrupt natural languages. Uh, so to interrupt the grammar of being and thought. Here, digital art will be speaking a socio-technogenic language that is not a mimesis of the world, but a vacuum of, neg of negative marks at the end of the world as we know it. Ultimately, the question is not to grant a form to aesthetics, whether recursive or discrete, uh, although this is important, but to address how the servomechanic form of instrumentality opens always a vacuum, a quantum vacuum in the, in the, um, in the ontological indeterminacy. 
um, uh, to say with Karen Barad, as much as it opens an ontological terror of blackness to say with Calvin Warren, I don't know if you know this book, um, Ontological Terror, where, um, you know, uh, it's talking about, you know, they're both talking about how the vacuum is at the core of thought and the sense. Um, and here, AI is a stranger, as an alien, as a negative of the world, um, uh, uh, moves within and across and outside the colonial, sexuated, racial metaphysics of capital. So in a way, instead of a recursive recuperation of capital, not to say that you know, this model doesn't exist, but to say, what is the critical work that I am interested in doing? Not everyone has to do this work. But I think it's, a, it's an important work that has yet to be done. So thank you very much. Thanks, Luciana, for this. This was really wonderful and thought provoking. Um, I think we'll open the floor immediately to questions since we just have so many people here. And if you haven't signed in already, please sign in so that we have a record and it'll be helpful for our application this year. Uh, and we definitely have snacks in the back and wine, so do we I'm happy to clarify anything uh, that people might find, uh, yeah, interesting or not. Yeah. Okay. Is anyone familiar with these um, models? I guess you guys. Yeah, right. there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of you working in this mode or outside, I don't know whether you feel um, that an attack on the sublime is impossible to actually engage with this question, because I think the question that, uh, you know, our all of us are asking in, in this kind of frameworks are important. So the question is not to, is to yeah, uh, open up the sublime to a different kind of critique on the Kantian model to, to a critique whether it's possible to do that. Is it possible to do that? Even the current, you know, models of, uh, where is it, of, uh, of generative AI, oh, all of you working with digital studies, could be film, could be photography, music. How, yeah, how do you, how do you escape the sublime or to the, this kind of recursive to the sublime? Yes. So, I think I understand and agree with your critique of the kind of correlational model mm -hmm. that is at stake in, in Steyrl's yeah. um, you know, critique of, of generative AI. I wonder, and I, yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree with that very much, and I think noise is the key, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, diffusion models are based on the addition of noise until yeah. the, it just dissolves into pure noise and then Markov chains to reverse the process. And I think that does take us somewhere else than simple correlation, right? Somewhere else than simple statistical. Statistical, correlation. exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. Exactly, right. And I'm thinking, you know, I mean, for me, you know, I mean, I've worked with this idea of discorrelation, which is yeah. not about statistical discorrelation, it's about phenomenological discorrelation. Yeah. And I've recently been trying to think these together. And I think that, yeah, maybe thinking them together brings us to pre precisely what you're talking about, about this non-instrumentality and this kind of void. Mm -hmm. I guess I my question is, and it's a question that I've been asking myself a lot, yeah. is whether I'm not putting too much weight on diffusion models, because there are so many other models oh, that work. You know, I mean, transformers. Transformers, I was going to talk about transformers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love transformers See, in that. It's very interesting. You, how, how that yeah. fits into this model. Because I don't mm. I don't know the answer, and that's why I'm yeah. just genuinely interested. Yeah, it, it, it's a language model. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, I don't know how, you know, we have to ask. Uh, sorry, I'm looking for a pen that was here one second ago. I'm uh, here. Uh, <laughs> It's um, you know one have to we we'll have to look at the the, the technical model to, to see whether whether it works because you know it's still um, it's, yeah it's still uh, well and also one has to look at the syntactical yeah thing that so I'm not too sure I think we we'll have to look at it 
we can, I don't know if people have a sense of what the transformer and the diffusion model are. We can just stand back there, not me, <laughs> anyone else. <laughs> Maybe we could unpack I mean, that a little bit. I mean, arguably noise is it's always in a similar way, yeah. but, but it's, it's kind of differently articulated, right? So I don't know. I don't know enough to, to say either, um, honestly. But um, it's, I don't know. It's just something I'm interested I in what you said about the correlation and discorrelation, mm -hmm. okay? So, and it's not a statistical. And in some work I was doing uh, before, is that, you know, there is definitely been uh, a break from the statistical into the computational. That at least, you know, if you would have to kind of create some kind of um, historical epistemology of, of, of this kind of thought that we make up because they don't exist as formally, you just have to look into the literature and try to see what comes after, what comes before, are they the same? You know, it's a, historically, it's, a, it's, a, it's very messy, I think. Although people are, have been doing that work for a long time, it's still very messy. Uh, I guess. Um, you know, if you think about uh, when the computation, what is the problem of computation? Why stop being statistical, right? And 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 when the computation and statistical merged in machine learning, for instance, it's a different it's a different time and it's a different um, articulation of the problem because for statistical the problem is probability and probability is already set, right? So it's not that it's already a given solution. And it's, not, it's a variable that is already accounted within the system. But the incomputable is not the same as probability. And it's, even if you look at, at the literature, some people will say, well, they overlap. But actually, the incomputable just is the point at which randomness is so big that cannot be compressed in a smaller thing than it is, which is just what you can represent, but not what it is. What is we don't know, but that we can represent with these numbers, okay? But we know there's such more, but and, and, and computational just workbook can be seen. Whereas the statistical probability is all of it. It's already, there's no infinity to it. So on this, this is a, you know, just one purely um, technical, but it's not just technically, just because it allows for the system to actually embed the um, knowledge and know-how of other kinds, right? Because what, what kind of know-how do you need to actually uh, articulate the possibility that the system can work up to here and that the unknown becomes a variable as opposed to a statistical probability? That's a totally different, you know, would you, when it, and it's not an error that comes from the system. Uh, it's actually an unknown, the unknown becomes the variable the system needs to deal with. Right? And, and probability is not like that. I mean, for, for me, probability is always known. It's always something that the system, it's like you, you play in a video game, there's many layers, and in these many layers, there is, you can go, everything's already been scripted. And maybe in the interaction with different scripts, you can have, end up in A, B, and C, or X and Y, but they are more or less that you can merge and you can correlate. But what, when is the, you don't have a discorrelation. You don't have a moment of, you know, of, of um, disruption in these two levels and that create your own level. I mean, that doesn't exist yet, right? Although it could exist. But that would be the level in which the generative, that's what is very important. So, and also the generative, she misses the generative in that way. You know, because well, in the generative is the word that, uh, you know, very, very problematic word because again, it's, um, very teleological in a way, generative. Uh, or you can say, you know, it's immanent without without a, a schema, but usually it's got a schema to generate something for something else. It's instrumental in that way, right? But uh, the generative is also in the sense, um, you know, it's, um, you know, she's talking about apophenia, apophenia, you know, this phenomena that uh, bring, uh, you know, work with, with the, with the hypothesis that is not longer there, but you know the generative in this sense is pushing uh, into the access the unknown. The access the unknown is clearly part of the of this techno um, governmental or techno aesthetic system. The statistics doesn't have. So Galton she uses Galton to talk about this profiling and taxonomy. And uh, uh, and this one, right? And the blurring, 
this one right, it says uh, you know it, uh, you you, can, you cannot blurring with photography right i guess you could have had the overlapping you could have some kind of uh third image the third face but the blurring the, in this case is really about you know the for me it's about the, the unknown the uh, as a, it's a quantity of information that can only be rendered to a certain point. And it's only a question of optimization at some point. That at some point, those blur images will actually become a, a readable image. So what? What's the problem? That would be just that the system is able to clean. But the fundamental problem of the system is always there. That you can't get rid of noise. <laughs> at least, you know, even, in if, even if you do quantum computing, you can't get, you can't get rid of noise. Or can you know you can render it, and then it, it, it manifests itself in different forms, but you can't get rid of it. So it doesn't mean that it, it's an ontology. It, that's the point. That people think it's an ontology. It's another being. It's not another being. Because, yeah. well, uh, that was my question: is yeah. distinguishing the kind of work around noise or glitch or error, mm -hmm. interruption, sort of in itself as being a kind of possible critique. You seem to be wanting to say that that's not a right path, but I wasn't mm -hmm. quite sure where yours distinguishes itself from that. Yeah, no, absolutely. That is so. There is an interesting, you know, uh, take on glitch, even in, in kind of other kind of culture or theories or uh, arguing like glitch feminism is, is, is a book and yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's in legacy. So it's an interesting book because she's take, you know, she. In a way, uh, um, this, there was much within media theory, there was so much uh, oh, yeah, glitch arguments and hacking and glitching in the 90s. And, and you know, also painting your CD with, uh, with something to, let, to, to make it skip. And people like, produce music nowadays, right? right? And, and art and all sorts, uh, sort of visual art as well. So definitely, um, the problem with that, so that's an interesting take that she's coming back with glitch feminist because it's a totally different take and it's, you know, interesting. Uh, but what I, in terms of is that this argument that we are talking about, I think that for me, uh, a glitch is uh, is uh, talking for uh, about an interruption of being to actually uh, give sense to another kind of uh, existence. It's existential. Uh, and my question is, where does it exist? In which world does it exist? You know, so, and, and if you're talking about, you know, there's only one world, you know, and the, the world is the world where, you know, it's, uh, it, whose principles are uh, uh, extremely uh, based on surrogacy and extraction, and there's only that. That's the only word, <laughs> the only word possible, you know, like, you know, my dear friend um, Mark Fisher used to say it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capital because there is only one word, capital. And that is the point. <laughs> it's the end of the world is impossible because it's capital is the only word. Um, and so uh, in, in, that, in that question, so I, I, for me, where I'm closing is that noise and um, or oh, one can think of other forms. I don't know if noise is the only form. And the meaning of noise. I don't know if you read uh, uh, Cecile Malaspina. Yeah, the yeah, epistemology of, of noise. Very interesting. She, she talked about the negation of the negation. Mm -hmm. right? So there is this, for me, it's, oh, OK, what, what is it that we are negating? It? She is negating the, the subsection, sub, subjection of noise uh, to, to recursivity. It's interesting. I, it's another way to understand that noise is producing meaning without a word, without being, without to uh, be uh, be attached to an ontology. Because being attached to an ontology will be to ask for being including in the word that excludes, and, and that's a problem that you know in uh, black feminist studies, uh, queer and trans studies is a is lacking. Like, finally, you know, a very it's not just popular. It's in, it's a question of asking the pillar of philosophy to be changed. <laughs> it's in, you know, so I think it's a very important point that uh, with other sides uh, with that kind of politics, because 
it's it's important today. It's always been important, and the way that is so much on the surface today with this kind of question of, of aesthetics and, 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 and machines, it's definitely to you know to to open up to open up towards that side rather than recuperating media as an ontology. Why are we doing that? And there is a school for that. We were talking about it. But what what does it what does it do critically then? So, yeah, thanks for those questions. Yeah. I don't know if I'm training or not learning is, is also, also the, is sufficient, because how do you untrain? Mm. I don't know if people think about how do you untrain uh, uh, your, you know, your, your model? Uh, and now you allow for an, an untraining of perception, conception, imagination, uh, with the with ubiquity, ubiquitous presence of this model everywhere. How do you untrain? I never know how to answer that question. You know, the undoing, the learning, because as opposed to what I'm trying to say is that you stay in there because that's where the thing is. That's the antagonism is already there rather than having to, you know, step out because, you know, um, being out and being on the negative side, I don't think that people would like that. <laughs> just to say, oh, just get rid of all your privileges. How you feel about that? Andre, really? Who, who's doing that? I'm not sure. So I, I don't see as uh, I've already, yeah, as a political, I understand as a kind of, um, uh, work and it's an exercise and uh, you know and for instance there's been a kind of you know um, optical unconscious exercise and you know in terms of that kind of aesthetic political moment of the 70s and you know the, the kind of deformation transformation uh pluralization multiplication but they are always within this kind of um, setting up of a world where you have a role, which is uh, and, uh, of being included, or you have to work to be included, you know, uh, and prove that you are included all the time. You're suffering a, in a kind of politics of the small p, which would be yeah. to be included, that, that there's a more radical critique, which is to be included is always to be included in an instrumental. In an instrumental, yeah. Mm-hmm. Saying more, say more. Well, no, it's interesting because I'm also working on so this. Any, it's any easier to see paths with the small p version of it because mm -hmm. that's where a lot of like glitch art and so on. We, mm -hmm. You can see it's about inclusion within that. that in that the, tradition, or make a tradition. Mm -hmm. but, but it's harder, and, and I'm not quite sure I followed in your talk what the, mm -hmm. what, what the conditions for the appearance of let's call it the void of non-instrumentality mm -hmm. within experience itself, whether that is what, what you're, like a, not a sublime, but something that's like analogous to it, but more radical than the sublime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so you can escape the sublime, okay? Now that's one point, I mean, you cannot escape it, right? So it's very hard to escape, but to understand what role it's, uh, is actually, what function it is having, within uh, some form of, of uh, uh, cultural political pro uh, production, which aesthetic is part, and, and to uh, push it to it, so to explode it, it's important. So for instance, for me, like where it is, so for me, I don't know, if you read the Fred Modern on the barbecue and, and, and jazz, or if you read the other kind of uh, work, you know, or the uh, the which I think would work. There is this kind of it's, it's grotesque, the sublime enters, there's so much, but then there's always an, an incompleteness of it. So it's everywhere, I would say. Everywhere this the sublime is, this is it as well. This impossibility of the, of the sublime to recover uh, philosophy, because it's the work of philosophy, is there too. So it's not about coming, it's not about people to come, it's not messianic, we're not waiting for a new AI that can disrupt the sublime. No, I mean, 
or, or we'll go back and say there was a, a non sublime, then it became sublime before, like before modernity, like people, I don't know, the work uh, thing, my, my in, 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 um, yeah, kind of, uh, it's, I am insecure about looking at this kind of ontological model before a global capital, because it's a model of, um, you know, it's a nostalgia, it's a, it's, a, it's a model of preserving the beginning of cultural knowledge, like singular techno diversity argument, you know, where we can expand the knowledge so that everyone is included. For me, also, it's a way to politically take away this uh, condition where wherever there is this blood is also the negative. And how are you dealing with it? Where you, how, what is dealt with in that moment? That's, that's quite important, right, as opposed to say, oh, it's uh, obliterated or, or it's incorporated or it's, you know, um, so maybe in anything, maybe in glitch as well, there is a moment in which the glitch is not completely doing the sublime work, but the sublime work is also to recuperate the, uh, you know, the imaginary number into a number, for instance, but the imaginary number is still there. So how, how it is manifested, that's an interesting question. How can you manifest it? Um, not that you, I think it manifests itself, that is the point, but it's not an immanent thing that is always there, you know, that you don't have to do nothing about it before, <laughs> right? Because that's another question. If it's always there, uh, then what kind of, is it just another way and say, like, uh, let's say, affect theory, we say. It's, it's always a sensible, that it's always political, it's always there, and, and um, it's part of it, the very matrix of being or something, right? That's a problem, right, I guess. I was thinking that that could be the other side of the Kantian, like through the um, theological connection, the, the sort of radical anti-instrumentalism of the organism, you know, and mm -hmm. it could be like, Life is the contingency, which, which maps onto a lot of contemporary philosophy biology, which is the radical singularity of every organism mm -hmm. and its life history through mm -hmm. contingency. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know about something you thought about. Or... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about this. I, I've, read, I've read about some of this, that there was this two pieces before, some also the uh, kind of um, biological or evolutionary model, as you were. Um, yeah. I'm not sure about that because I'm not sure about the, the organological myself. Because for me, the organological is is a logic uh, of the organic. Even if you do my own life, right? Uh, um, somehow, uh, you know, washes out a little bit the the terror, the terrorism, the terrorism of becoming uh, human or being alive. There is definitely a terrorism there, even in biopower. That was, even Foucault could say there is a terrorism, right? You know what I mean? That the kind of enforcing uh, of, of a norm of, of having to show that you perform, that you're alive, that you're successful, that you're a biosuccessful organism. I'm not sure about that. I don't think I want to adapt it in my, I understand it, but it's not where my critique wants to go, I think. Mm. Yeah. It's colder than that. <laughs> Much colder than that. It yeah. must be like a reason why babies scream when they first exit the womb. It's terrifying. Yeah. Is it the reason why? A baby screams when it exits the womb. Mm -hmm. Terror of life. Yeah. yeah, the scream of a baby is the terror of life, you would yeah. say. You know, the, you know, the scream, basically, uh, to, to war, against the world. Yeah, and I guess you know, I was thinking about this question too of like generativeness and uh, thinking about it in relation to your previous work on like mm -hmm. object sex and reproduction and the like. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know if you were thinking too about like these sorts of lines of thinking about the word generative. Yeah, no, it's a very, as I say, problematic word for me. Yeah, and I, yeah. I thought it was also funny because for this poster, I put it into Delhi to um, negative aesthetic of AI. And at first it said AI minus one, but then it eventually came up with this one, like this poster. I like, like <laughs> you came out with a person? With this poster. Oh, with the poster, AI minus one. Yeah. <laughs> cool. 
Ja. Andy Mann. Das ist dann die Skelettin. Nein, klar, ne? So, um, yeah, so I guess uh, the generative, if, yeah, because it's, it's everywhere, right? The generative is, is, seems to be the, everything that, uh, everywhere politically as a kind of alternative to reproduction, right? And I've used it very much in abstract sex. There's uh, something that is completely immanent without, it's like a process without thought. The thinking without thought, i.e. without subject or object is this kind of immanentism of the procedure. But I am I have a problem with that because actually the immanentism of the procedure the procedure really save you from the structure in which the procedure is set, where the subject and object are always there. You know, I'm not sure. I will just that what kind of politics will it then be? Will it be exactly will it not bring us way back into the sensible as being by the very sheer being the sensible, anti-Platonic, anti-Kantian, or anti-representational. Or how do you know? It's an epistemological question. How do you know that generative is generative? What kind of system do we have to say this is generative or what and why? You know, what is can we rethink of the means and the end in a way that is not just in this technological framework um but it's uh you know but it's still like uh, or the immanent end which is you know this dialogical moment or, or this moment that you're talking about or, or larwell moment of the in the last instance but it's the real that clone itself into so and every time pushes so out of it so kind of schema all the time that's what it does that's that's what it offers but then again um, I need to know how I know, right? It doesn't, otherwise it's just this immanent emanation of, you know, of, 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 uh, of politics without um, politics. <laughs> it's the problem, you do politics without politics. It's this conundrum that are very hard to question, to ask, because I understand that, I think you can suspend ontology. How do you know without being? A thinking without being, it's more uh, for me permissible of a thinking without knowing that you're thinking. You know, I, I, you see what I mean? I don't know if both people think it's the same because the question of uh, of epistemology of know how is so important. Uh, this epistemological question that should not be, you know, simply Aristotelian or you know Kantian or Heideggerian, but it could be also, you know, there are. There's a culture, right? A culture that knows, a culture that knows that there's traditional legacy of, uh, you know, survival in those terms of, you know, you can say they are tactics, but if you think about, you know, tactics of, you know, survival, uh, you know, with under a regime of total, brutal uh, violence of colonialism, they're not just tactics. You know, they, they are not just tactics. There, there's a know how, there is a, a knowledge that is not just static. Uh, they know that they say know that you know how to know. You know when you uh, get stopped by the police in uh, US, I hope you know how to know. You need to know how to know, right? There is something about, um, uh, or you know, you are in a violent uh, environment every day where you you, know, you are assaulted, where your life doesn't exist every day, and you need to know how. <laughs> So there are no know-how. So, but you need to ask that question. How do you know that you know? I don't know where to take it from, as opposed to just repeat the fact that oh, there is an episteme and a paradigm. You know, because those episteme and paradigm don't exist for certain people. For you know, within the structure of power or biopower, they, they only exist from the standpoint of who has power, and for no one else. So that, that is a political question. I don't know how to answer that. But I don't want to talk about the generative as mainly immanent without, you know, know-how. I think this is a problem. I don't know what other people think about the generative. So you can also take it to think, to, to you know, to create, a, to, to think of it in terms of generative monstrosity or generative heretics. You know, like Sylvia Winter would talk about the generative as 
know-how as heretic knowledges. You know, as she talks about the plot and the plantation as two things at the same time. There are different forms of knowledge. They are, you know, antagonists to each other and co coexistent, yet never overlapping, never merging. Um, and that is different form of gener generative uh, thinking in terms of the plot, right? And you eat uh, bushes and herbs and no one eats. And that's how you're generating a culture of, um, yeah. So I don't know, but those are questions I have. I don't know how to answer this question, but there are who other people have other ideas of how to call the generative, negative generative, you know, it should be a non-generative, right? it should be something that denies or is denied to be generative. You know, there's always this question that um, if you get to a pre program, and some people will say, ah, when did you start? When did you know that you were generative, that you could think? Like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's this question because you're not expected to be there. So gen gen the generative is also performative. There's, there is so much implicated into that, that one is, will have to unpack and do a start <laughs> That critical work, but we all use it very, very commonly. We all seem to know what it means. Yeah. Good question. Um, as I'm thinking about the untraining and unlearning, um, and also the negative aesthetic, I feel like there's um, you, you you talked about the temples, you know, but there seems to be a a hierarchy or. Um, so, for example, with on training, right? Uh, um, I I don't know this work, so I'm just guessing what might be uh, an example. And, and so, one example would be to remove a given sample from the training, the training staff. To remove a given, to remove a sample, I remove my, like um, on the on the the on a program. Is yeah. So, a, like, and, and of course, remove. there's a question of like, can you actually ever truly remove a sample from a training set after a model has been trained? Mm -hmm. Um, but you can also imagine of a different scale, um, for example, what you have here of these categories that it starts to associate with something, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then maybe there's another scale that's sort of like um, above both of, like it encompasses both of those and that's uh, maybe a more ontological scale of um, like, yeah, the ways that it sees um, the world. And, and, and of course there's some yeah, the, the, the way it sees the word. Yeah, I see the way, like like even the idea of categories or the idea of um, yeah, yeah, like how is it categorizing different things to like create mm -hmm. the, what what it's it's almost like a structure that that is over uh, uh, maybe a invisible structure that's that yeah. is like going through to like logic through. Um, and so I, as I think about untraining and unlearning, I wonder what of those skills are we talking about? Because I also think it's relevant to the negative aesthetic, right? Mm -hmm. Like each of those skills that we just talked about can have things that are not wanted. Um, and so that's one thought. And then on the other hand, it's not wanted by who? Um, because I also think there's like some level of um, another like level of complexity that gets overlaid on top of it when you start thinking about who doesn't want, like who is it negative to? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. right, and, and yeah. right, there's like ontological assumptions that yeah, there as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, anyways, I, I just had any, uh, I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on frameworks that might go about structuring um, those levels of hierarchies mm -hmm. um, in some way um, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, thank you very much. That's a very interesting uh, uh, idea and comment in terms of uh, scaling. You know, that there is, uh, because in a way, when we talk about computational systems, there's always layers, right? And there's this kind of transparency of the layer. And that's, uh, you know, that's why we were talking about when you teach social media and you talk about, you know, the questions of discreteness, the, you know, the students don't know what you're talking about because it's seamless, right? There is no encounter with the deep, there's no encounter with the temporality or the discreteness, the discord, there is no none of that. There's a, so so the and, and the layering of the computational, you know, 
some people will say you, know, you start with the hardware, you know, this all that we know this, this all this tool all the way down. Uh, and so when you remove the training, that you can never remove it. You can't remove the trace. You know, like if you do, you know, a MySpace, it was ages ago, I have this friend who has a trace on MySpace, and MySpace is somewhere and it cannot be removed. That's the thing. With the computational model, there is no possibility of being removed. But is there a possibility of being forgotten? forgotten or removed within the archive. You know, that's a question of the digital archive the, or the archaeology, right? There's always a trace. The archaeology of media would say, no, there's always a trace. It's not just digital. It's, uh, there's always a, um, a, a kind of uh, um, fossil, a, a fossil trace somewhere, which is very interesting to think about in terms of, you know, media ecology, you know? But then, so to do that work would be a proper abolition. That's what it is. It's an abolition work that is, you know, an, an expanded and intensified level of abolition. Um, some people say, you know, you, there's so much embedding in these systems, right? And the embedding is cultural, it's historical, it's technology. That's why when you talk about, that's why I'm saying you cannot just talk about the aesthetic without thinking about the pillars of knowledge and the function of aesthetic that is to do with this onto epistemological pillar, so colonialism, racial capital, patriarchy, they are all there, you know, and it's not just about the bias, it's the very pillar of the techno social genic structure that repeats itself, like uh, kind of restructures itself every time there is an interaction. So it's, you can't get out, you can't. So that's why I'm saying, well, how do you want to train and learn? I don't know. I don't know how you do it, about who is able to do that. Um, and, and do you really want to be completely abolished? Are you, uh, do you know what it means? <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> There are so many um, ethical questions that are political, that are, well, they are ethical, but they're not, they're like, where are, you know, where is your project? Where is your project, the critical project? You know, why, why are we doing critique? You know, what, what is the critical uh, moment of, uh, of removing? So you can remove yourself from, you close your Instagram account, I don't know, you can close your, but there's always a trace there because you've been there, because you've been scripted in the system, because you are part of the onto-epistemological restructuring. All of us <laughs> are part of it, right? Um, and even if you say, oh, I don't use my mobile or whatever, like uh, Taken, the, the collective Taken, you know, they, they want, they, their attack is to just say absolute refusal, right? The absolute refusal uh, doesn't save you from being already scripted in the system. So you can just say, ah, it's not my responsibility, I don't want to know it. <laughs> Your trace is there anyway. And, and that trace has connotation, right? For whom you have been there. And what, so we are, in a way, all responsible of the system, uh, which then, on the other hand, this, uh, this this idea of, uh, but I like the idea that the negative aesthetic could also be, you know, could ask this question at which layer, where you can, where is the level that the negative can actually happen. But the, the point, uh, like I said, is that it does happen all the time because there's always to be a negation for the system to operate. Mm -hmm. And so there is the trace of the negation of the excluded, or the, the violence is always there. Uh, at every click or on click, whether you are there or not, it's already in the kind of neuro uh, cognitive aesthetic experience. Uh, and then on the other hand, so that is the way in which turn that negation into a negative persistence of, 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 uh, of being negated without reconstituting, without like, um, Someone, I think the Fred Morton is saying, how do you resist the seduction of, of wanting to be included? So it becomes a question of, you know, desire as well. You know, what is that desire that is, makes you stay in the frustration as opposed to wanting to be recognized? And, and this is your desire, my desire, our desire, where is death, right? What is it?
Do you, do you disagree then with Stickler that when he talks about disautomatization as a kind of strategy? Yes. Unfortunately, I do. Yes. No, I do disagree. I don't think. <coughs> well, who can do that? What is the privilege to do that? And, and how do you do it? If you, okay, a program of total abolition, sure. <laughs> when, is, you know, any time, right? But that, it's, a, it's a program. It needs to be a program. It cannot just be a kind of uh, uh, gesturing, because the gesturing is, is a problematic gesturing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this ontology question. Do you have a question? Um, I want to go back. Yeah, well, just a sort of um, question clarification thing, thoughts. Um, this question of like withdrawal and a sort of radical break, um, or um, uh, within the system, I'm, I'm interested in this question of um, the non human as a sort of like generating its own rules, right? Mm -hmm. To the to the um, and the opacity that is in, involved in that in the process, and sort of the question of encounter, I guess, an aesthetic encounter, the human encounter with these non-human processes yeah. um, as a, a moment of apprehend apprehension or evaluation of negativity as such, as opposed yeah. to negativity being the process itself, the sort of ontological. Process. Yeah. Yeah. No. That's that's exactly this this moment of that it stays as such. Yeah. You can't resolve it. So you know you can't. You know the recursive system will always use it, exploit it, extract it, reify it, but it cannot. Uh, you know it stays as such, right? And and so, um, and that's the interesting thing of not wanting to submit to a model of reproduction of governance. At least that's not what I want to do, right? In terms of saying this is total surveillance. That's that's not in uh, that's not what is. That's why contingent is always interesting because it's opening up a little space. Um, but then this encounter of of, of the of the non-human is. This generative capacity. I mean, the non-human is, is so in, is such an interesting question because on one end we have all, um, we cannot tend to think of the non-human as the, the the machine, and that's why I think in order to think about the non-human or the machine, you need to think about this um, servo mechanic condition of the non-human. And when you open the box, then there is, again, you have to deal with the ontopistemology that uh, operates a, a discriminatory uh, machine of who is, who is in and who is out, what is in and what is out, how one is in, how one is not out. So you go straight to what it means to be human, straight away. So the fact that the machine carries a non-humanity is interesting. Right, because you can open it up that box as opposed to say the machine is an agency. I'm not interested in that kind of question of the agents and the machine. Because that leads us straight away, although I've been interested before, you know, it's a totally important question because, you know, um, it's research and, and you are, you know, uh, trying to develop a theoretical intervention or some kind. So, I mean, I'm not just justifying myself, but everyone else <laughs> to think about this too, you know. But it's that uh, just that the agency then it becomes another form of um, um, subjectification, also subject subject position. Uh, in this piece that I wrote, the alien subject of, of, of AI, I think I was thinking about um, the impossibility of agency of AI because um, it's not. The human, the non-human, the fact that the non-human can have an agency leads itself into this system of inclusion and exclusion and becomes another form of will and free freedom, free will, right? And the agency, where is the agency? Do you intend, does is in, uh, agency an intentional thing or is it a vectorial thing? That if it's a vectorial thing, then it's not really an agent, it's a collective agent. But then the collective agent is still devoid of agency, right? As classically thought in terms of an intention towards something. 
So you can talk, think about it in terms of sensory motor, like in AI, you have had all this, you know, correlation or connection, connectivist model where agents, collective agents was the thing, it was the model. Uh, where you know you just oriented the system, especially in this in its kind of interactive uh, user way, inter inter uh, the where the system in orients itself uh, according to response, right? So it's just physical in that way. That it's not really an intentional program. It's just something that comes as a responsive motor reaction, but that's no agency. You know, that's just a motor sensory reaction or, you know, it's more a vehicle model uh, of, of being inducted by a stimuli, but it's not really agency. But agency in terms of non-human agency, which I think comes from the science and technology studies, it's a problem because it, I don't know if for you too, but it, it's, a, it's a way of flattening out uh, according to a universal model, what agency is. So, you know, I, yeah, I think. But I think there's an interesting. Maybe there is something more time. Well, I think it's just that the um, implementation of these technologies yeah. are, are often um, uh, um, based on an assumption of agency, on yeah. the, right? So I think that's ah, an interesting right. question. Yeah, because the, the idea that it's both philosophy that delivers agency to work yeah the agency of the machine is to do something you know is to work for philosophy to actually uh, deliver the thought or deliver the program or deliver something or execute or carry but it's never its own you know so to have an agency so the idea that it can have an agency you know breaks the subject of relation but actually it's a trick it doesn't really break it i think it's a trick can I ask you? Yeah. So I feel like maybe this is related to this question of agency, but also to your earlier comments on know-how. And yeah. I I mean I was really intrigued by what you were saying. And I I agree with your critique of untraining, unlearning on this model, but I wonder still if there's something like an unlearning of, of habit, like not necessarily embodied habit, but I would yeah. say that's part of the, the nexus where this to techno sociogenic principle, yeah. you know, gets implanted, right? So yeah. um, I'm just wondering, yeah, is that right? Is that is that where you're going? I mean, so, so in other words, if there is a kind of unlearning, like if there is through this negative aesthetic, which mm. is, I don't know exactly, but I think a recognition that's not the right word, but mm -hmm. an experience of something that, yeah, can be there in glitches, for example, mm -hmm. but is not necessarily liberatory, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Then is this oh, encounter, yeah. but can this encounter then have the kind of um, political, um, I don't know, payoff? I, I can't mm -hmm. think of good words right now, exactly. but, you yeah. know, of, of helping to unlearn habits of being, habits of, of mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the categorizations that are imposed and whatnot, which goes beyond this kind of technical unlearning, mm -hmm. but is maybe not completely distinct from mm -hmm. it. Do you see what I'm getting yes, at? Yes, Like, I don't think that will get us there, but I wonder if an encounter with the negativity that could be exposed in that way mm -hmm. could help in some way. Do you see what I'm getting yeah, at? Yeah, I'm thinking about this idea of the lesson that read this stratification, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. the destratification, how do you make yourself a body without organ destratification? What is the war machine? This are this one way of thinking about it in terms of destratify. And 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 their argument was always, but that's not my argument, just making a certain example. Sure. Their argument is always this idea of, uh, uh, you know, exactly, uh, learning your habits, right? That they take from this uh, Bergsonian model of, uh, you know, the habitual perception and, uh, um, you know, that creates this structure of, uh, um, of cognitive stability as well, as opposed to, you know, opening, think about perception as a bodily distributed, hence, you know, socially bodily distributed in a way. And hence, each time, 
you know, there's oh, there's each time there's a, a, a disaster. So this habituation and habituation are actually a longer continuum as opposed to all constantly happening. And also, especially, you know, if you think about the Frankfurt School, I mean, especially uh, Adorno and Benjamin in that way of always disabituating, you know, that there is this kind of, or the shock to thought, right? The idea that you, every time you think there is this kind of, uh, uh, the way that technology takes over your thinking, it disabitues the, the neurocognitive habitual, yeah, this structure. So that, in a way, you can say happens all the time. And it's an adaptive model. You know, it's an adaptive model of, you know, adapting to the environment that um, it, it itself constitutes your habitual centers. I think that happens all the time. So in a way that is, um, it's not political, you know, and, and, and the, you know, but then what really forces thinking through or breaks through from uh, its own uh, um, uh, potentiality that will be political. So what does it mean? Uh, it's not just, you know, one, on one hand, this habituation, this habituation is always there, but the destratification, not to become a woman, then it becomes a, a problem, right? Because how do you do that, right? I don't know how. So I think at some level, their learning, their training is, uh, is, is definitely linked to uh, the possibility, of how do you do that? <laughs> you know, how, and it's not just a dishabituation. And because will this habituation just help the disabituation of seeing more women in uh, in AI, uh, or you know, um, uh, you know, black people or native people or disenfranchised or this diversely able people part of designing the AI? Is that what it will disabituate the model of? racial capital that we have, I mean, I'm not sure. And that is where everyone is going. Oh, let's employ these cool, cool kids who have done a little bit of uh, computational art I mean, so that they can be in our ethical committee and help us to design AI in a way that is diverse, because we need that. We need to respond to all these things. People are asking, Gary, we have... Uh, does he, is that enough? Will they allow? Will, what does? What, which box you have to, uh, you know, sit in order to disabituate that? Yeah, you disabituate that, but you what do you habituate? Is the model of inclusion? That's what you are habituating. So I'm not sure. It's just a norm. Which is a norm, which we are in another norm. You know, and it's not a refusal. So I don't. But I know. Um, so it's definitely. Something is an interesting question, or you are and you are learn, but I guess it should not just be the result into an ethic AI. Because right. ethic AI is already <laughs> uh, taken by the system. Yes. But I don't know, help me think, because I might be totally wrong. I totally agree. Just we're almost done. And we've done this before, so. Do you, do you yes. want another question? Or Maybe another question, then we go. Uh, what about the people? Yeah, so yeah, there's, there's one, one from Zoom, if Hank wants to read it out loud. From Vivian Ju, who writes, uh, thanks, Luciana, for the wonderful presentation. You can also see it, probably, too. Oh, my uh, chat. In chat. Yeah, for the wonderful presentation, are there any aestheticization of AI works done in forensic studies? Forensic studies. Well, you mean like um, the work of a Yal Weisman? Maybe? Like, uh, uh, probably. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I'm thinking in terms of, uh, you know, the work of uh, this whole forensic architecture <coughs> group uh, this, uh, in, uh, in London, visual culture, I think, is still there. At least that's the last time I, I know uh, I've heard of them. But yeah, that's the. the um, you know, it's more like, uh, you know, a way of losing, using algorithm and data to actually trace uh, models of um, uh, attack and discrimination against, uh, especially all kinds of borders, but especially his work on this on the Palestinian Israeli border. So, tweeting today about. Yeah, they were tweeting okay. today. Yeah. So that's 
groundwork uh, AI has been doing for a long time, but they do all kinds of border and forms of genocide where they, they excavate the data, and they reconstruct the data, uh, or what could have been, if you had that data, so it's, it's a visualization on one end, but also, you know, an aesthetization in terms of, uh, you know, of, of creating awareness, political awareness of what data can do in terms of, uh, Somehow, not just restoring the truth, but just complicating the truth, I think. But it's always, you know, this question of, are you actually uh, use this kind of archive of data that then, you know, you can computational process to create a fabulation, as it were, um, of what could have been, or what it was that was not said, right? This kind of uh, traces of, um, you know, what is counter-actualized, right? So, so, you know, what we know, what could, could have been counter-actualized. So I say counter-actualization. I think that'd be the <coughs> nice way to, to think about uh, what they do as opposed to a visualization of, you know, of the past as well. Just collect data and create some kind of representation. That's not what they are interested in, but maybe a counter-actualization is probably yeah, what they do. So that's that's definitely yeah something interesting. But I don't think it's the same as the negative aesthetic, uh, which, which I think um, does pose the question of uh, um, of, of of the violence of this habituation, mm -hmm. like this stratification. It's a bad, you know, who would want to destratify and how is it easy to find a project where everyone wants to get rid of everything? And, and what does it mean? And what about, uh, uh, you know, condition where you never had nothing and nothing is the condition of every day? So, yeah, so these are tensions. I mean, yes, it's tensions. I don't know the solution. Thank you. Yeah, well, give Gianna Parisi a round of applause. Thank you. Donation of bagels. Since we've already opened up all the cheese and the charcuterie, please help yourself to that as well. Um, and we have this room for as long as like the rest of the day. So I guess we could either drink it or have open a bottle of wine, or some of us could go to the treehouse, whatever you guys prefer. Yeah. Yeah. Can we? I don't know. <laughs> you can yeah, ask you questions. I, uh, I, I could also go out to air, but um, if we go for some wine here, we can have a chance to chat one to one, or that's fine. We can stay for a little bit. Have any other questions?